So uh, this talk is on hacking the job market. It's basically a lot of reconnaissance, a little bit of psychology, uh, some tech, not a lot of tech. So if that's what you're expecting, great. If not, there's a tech-heavy presentation next door. Uh, so let me introduce myself. Those who saw my first presentation have seen this joke. This is me. I've been at this for a while. And this is what I do. I have a company. I teach people how to do stuff. This is B-side, so I'm not going to get any further into that. So, foundations. When you're looking for a job in today's market, you need to start with a base foundation of uh, consolidation of online presence. Uh, typically, this is a website. People are doing you know, different things these days. There are lots of ways you can do it, but generally it's a website that collects all of the blog posts, papers you've written, presentations you've given, articles, books, anything like that in one spot so you have control over how you appear online. And that's really what you're going for is as much control as you have uh, over your online presence, over your offline presence, over the companies you target, and how you present yourself to them. Without this foundation, the job search will fail. With the foundation, you can land a job that matches you rather than trying to modify yourself to fit a hole that, that has been left by somebody who's left a job. Um, that way you don't leave the job too quickly, you, know, you can really grow in the job and, and it works with you. So that's the fundamental idea behind what we're going over. So the goal with the, the public site is to own the internet. So you want to search on Google, Bing, and Yahoo and basically control as many of those hits as you can. Uh, a lot of us focus first on Google because that's what we use, but it's important to remember that with uh, the change in Firefox, a lot of people's default search engine has shifted to being Yahoo, and anybody on Windows using IE has always defaulted to Bing, so you have to have a presence there too. Now, how do you get these hits? Um, if you're old enough to have a nice work history behind you, you can start repurposing other things you've done. Uh, if you're still in school, you, know, you can repurpose papers, uh, presentations you've given there, and just try to get as much stuff out there as you can on as many different sites as you can like Scribd, SlideShare, things, YouTube, things like that, because the way all of these search engines work is the cross-linking raises the ranking, and if you want everything interesting to be at the top, so all the embarrassing stuff you've done over your life is towards the bottom and people don't find it as easily. Um, if you're in a working environment and you're behind the scenes like most of us tend to be, you need to slowly move towards having more public work done. That can mean getting involved in the marketing efforts. That can mean going to conferences like this and presenting and, oh, it was recorded, it's online, I didn't know. You know things like that uh, help build you this online presence. Sometimes for people who are largely in a deep internal position, it can take more than one job hop to get fully public the way you need to get the job you really want. Um, other ways you can do it is working in open source, you know, volunteer for, for different groups, uh, do freelance work. Uh, there's a lot of freelance work out there right now. And if anybody here identify as a millennial? Anybody? Okay, a few. Um, your life will largely be freelance work. That's where the economy is going and that's what's being expected of people your age. Um, a lot of people my age are having a hard time dealing with that. You know, a lot of older people are losing jobs and they just can't get a permanent job, but many of them have managed to make more money than they ever made as a single employee working for multiple companies in multiple freelance you know, environments. Um, if you're looking to do this kind of thing in the open source community, uh, software development is the classic route. You, know, you can learn good skills that way, but the need is in writing manuals, inline help, online how-tos, things like that. You know, Open source technology is wonderful, but since it's written by engineers, it has crappy documentation and really poor project management. So if you're looking to build uh, a presence quickly, you can step into one of those roles and it'll, it'll work really well for you. So with that in mind, if you're employed, you might need to know how to leave. And when it's time to leave is really either you've grown out of the job or the job has grown away from you. And most companies go through four phases in their growth. Now, they can go backwards. It's not always a direct, relatively linear progression. Um, but you know, when, 
when a company starts out, it's usually a, you know, the stereotypical is the guy in his garage, right? You know, it could be a couple of people in their basement, it could be a small startup, but it tends to run under what I call cowboy style management, where people are, you know, know what needs to be done, they just get it done, and they move on. And uh, as the business grows, you have to start trusting your people. You know, around 20 to 30 people, it shifts from cowboy style management to a trust-based model where the people owning the company kind of trust what, what individuals are doing and give them the power to do it. Well, when they grow bigger, around the 50 to 75 range, that trust starts to break down because the person who owns the company is no longer hiring all those people and you start getting some light structure in on the management side. And then as it grows bigger, you get more structure and eventually at the really big side, you have multiple layers of middle management. What most people find is they're most comfortable at one of these four points. And when a company grows or shrinks below one of those levels, it's time to go. So it's important to kind of know who you are, how you feel the most comfortable, where you feel the most comfortable, so you can identify when that transition point is coming. So when it hits, you're prepared and you're not caught in a layoff or just feel like you hate going into work, stuff like that. I mean, there are other reasons why you can leave. You know, there are asshole job you know, um, managers that can come in. There are bad projects. You can get thrown out of the bus by people. But most of the people who make strategic job decisions, I find it's because one of these job transitions. Um, now, how do you identify when these are coming? You, know, it's, you can keep your eye on the business, kind of what's going on in the business, how are people hiring, you know, how's it growing or shrinking. You can also watch the industry. And the industry tells you what's going on job-wise through job ads. And if you, if you watch kind of how jobs flow, you'll know that here in the Midwest, you know, particularly in Iowa, you tend to get jobs after Minnesota gets jobs. Minnesota gets jobs after they get jobs on the coasts. So if you start setting up RSS feeds for job titles that interest you in major markets on the coasts and then in Omaha, uh, Chicago, and Minneapolis, you will get probably three to two months lead time on when those jobs will start hiring here. And you can be you know, ready for that as well. Okay, now, before we uh, go on into the, the job piece, I wanna talk a little bit about resumes. Um, resumes fail typically because there are too many. We're in a global economy, we're in a highly networked economy, which means every job opening can get hundreds to thousands of resumes. And what hiring managers are gonna do is filter as quickly as they possibly can to get down to resumes they actually care about. Nobody's gonna read a thousand resumes and base them on the merits. Many people won't even read 20. But generally speaking, you try to knock it down to about 20 and then you know, filter below that to get what you want. So often, the first cut is college degree. So if you don't have a college degree, you're often never, your resume may never get seen. Um, then it looks for certifications, looks for high salaries, looks for experience, you know, just trying to winnow the list down to as small as they can get. So today, most resumes are written to get search engine attention and to drive discussion, and that's it. Nobody makes hiring decisions based off of resumes anymore. So what about cover letters? Now, in the old days, you would include a cover letter with the resume to entice people to read the, the resume. Well, today, you know, with a thousand cover letters, nobody's gonna read those anyway. So you can be bold. You know, some people are doing some really interesting stuff with infographics. Has anybody seen the My Little Pony tech resume? Anybody? Okay, Google that one when you get home. It's, it's brilliant. The guy has basically created a resume that filters him out of 80% of all jobs, but the ones that like him, he's gonna stick out above everybody else. It's a perfect example of targeting. Um, you can target the similar way with cover letters. Um, what you wanna do is basically in five to 30 seconds, explain why somebody should hire you and ask for a meeting. Now, that's the traditional way to do it. Other ways to do it involve meeting people at conferences, you know, and uh, basically tracking people down through social media, through the internet, and getting the invite in. Because the key to success is to get past this filter process. You know, you wanna come in the back, in the back door and avoid all of HR's filters so that when they wanna hire you, 
the hiring manager or the CEO or whoever goes to HR and says, hire this person, and then they make you go through the steps, but it's already decided. You don't have to worry about being filtered out. You're just you know, um, dotting the I's and crossing the T's. Any questions? You know, th that's kind of the foundation stuff. Any questions at this point? All right. So let's talk a little bit about stories. Humans are hardwired for story. Uh, we want to know meaning. We want to learn meaning from others. And this is because we've evolved to learn from other people's mistakes. So you know, we really like hearing what others have done, how others have screwed up. We like laughing at them when they've screwed up, which is why I'm sharing some of the, the images I am. Um, so in a job interview situation, you have to be interesting without being arrogant. And what's really interesting is a lot of people start out when they're young as very arrogant, and then instead of learning to be interesting, they simply stop telling the interesting stories. So this is a really good uh, skill to try to learn, is how to tell a good story, how to be interesting, and uh, not come across as a braggart. So how do you do this? One way is uh, I go with this index, index card approach. So on an index card represents a problem. On that index card, you need to note why was the problem significant, who was affected. When you know who was affected, you've created the cast of characters for your story. With whom will the interviewer be sympathetic? That's the lead character. What challenges stood in the way? That's the villain. What didn't work? That's the hero's journey. Because you want to identify, this is the path I took. Otherwise, it's just, hey, problem, problem solved, you're done. And you want to have a little bit of a lead in, and I'll get into that in a little bit. On the back, you want to summarize that story in one line. And that story then goes in the resume, and the resume becomes this list of stories. And you don't worry about length. You know, if you've been in the job market for five years, you know, you might have two pages. If you've been in the job market for 30 years, you might have a lot more. Length at this point doesn't matter because you're going to be doing a self-filter before you send it out. So you basically put the stories in chronological order, build the master resume, and then when you're ready to go, you identify these are the stories I care about, to t I want to tell in the interview. You take everything else out, that's how it gets down to one page. So then you tell the story. Now, how do you tell a story? This is a classic story structure. You have an in initial hook, which is then partially resolved, and then you have a secondary hook, partially resolved, and then you've got the primary hook, and you end. You don't want to resolve the story when you're telling it because you want them to invite you in for an interview. So it's about kind of leading the discussion, planting enough information, as social engineers do, but instead of getting the data and getting out like you do in social engineering, you want to leave it there because they need to ask you back. The point of stories is to convince somebody else that you're awesome. And that means you need to understand the audience, you need to understand what they're interested in so you can repackage yourself to be interesting to them. And there are going to be typically three types of people you're going to talk to. There's the distracted type, you're going to have half half a minute to two minutes to get your point across. Uh, this is the classic elevator speech, you know, get it down to a very small amount so you can get it in and then hopefully they'll say, oh, tell me more. Second person is they're relatively attentive. You have between three and five minutes. This is where this narrative structure really comes in because you can expand, you can flesh things out. Um, for each point on the resume, you want to practice telling a story, using a timer and identifying you know, why did the problem matter? How did it affect people? What was the problem solving process? What solutions and challenges did you have? What was the final solution? And get that story told in three minutes. And leave the hooks there so they can ask you back later because what you want to do is convert these people into the third type, which is the involved or interruptive type. And they're going to be bouncing the ideas back off of you. It becomes much more of a discussion because discussions is how you make friends and friends hire friends. That's what you're wanting to have happen. So you want to let that, in that case, you want to let the story flow and expand and fill the time. This is another way to look at it from a social engineering perspective. So you've got an interest curve over time. When most people are having a conversation about what they're doing, there's a straightforward, you know, they're interested, they get more interested, their, you know, their curiosity gets satisfied, and they're done, 
and they go in and interview the next person. What you need to do is put little hooks in the conversation, each one boosting the interest level, so when you run out of time, they want to have you back to continue the conversation. That's the social manipulation you're going through. Um, you want to be incomplete, so they ask you back, so you can do the persuading. People like to be, understand things and get done, and that's, that's the psychological mechanism you want to trigger and, uh, and interrupt. So, uh, so yeah, these are the two conversation streams. So then you want to think about where do you want to go, okay? What, what kinds of things do you want to do? What kind of companies are there that do this? And this is a basic scoring approach. You know, list out the things that you find interesting, list out the companies you're considering, and score each one because this is a targeted job search. This is not a cast your resume to the wind and hope something bites. This is, you know, you have company number one, then two, then three, then four. Each one gets a custom variant of the resume. When you're targeting each one, you have modified your website or whatever web presence you're controlling so that it, it's targeted in order to maximize your chance at each step in the process. So we're going to stop a little bit here, talk about ethics. Okay? The rest of this presentation is about intelligence gathering. The companies you are targeting and the people you're talking to have not given you permission to do any of this stuff. So it's basically step one of a penetration test you're doing without authorization. Now, it's all public data. There's nothing necessarily illegal, though you can certainly use some of these tools this way. Um, but you have to decide before you start how deep you want to go. And the reason you want to do that is there are aspects of the internet that show aspects of people that you may not want to know. There are certain things about people you don't want to know when you're sitting across the table from them having a job interview. And it might help to look at what sorts of sites are out there that you don't want to go to before you start. And I'm not going to go any further than that. I'm sure you all know what kind of sites I'm talking about. Um, so basically, be careful. The other thing to know you're up against people who are going to be less careful. You're up against people who are going to be left less ethical, who are going to actually use active hacking to get the data they need. The model I'm talking about, the techniques I'm talking about, it's nothing new. People have been doing it for a long time. What's new is we're now aware of it. Okay? It's becoming a little bit more acceptable in some cases, a little less. Um, you don't want to do this kind of stuff in a military setting, for example. Uh, but a lot of bigger companies and smaller companies are expecting uh, more preparation from job interviewees than uh, we're used to giving. So with that, Google's a search engine. We all know that, but there's more. You know about Google News, I imagine. We've all used Google News. Um, but do you use Google News to search on a company name? the company you're targeting, the products they're, they're looking for, the officers that are involved. You know, there have been times when you can do a search on an officer and find out that the person you thought you were going to interview with just got arrested, and you're probably not going to be interviewing with that person. You know, it's useful data. Um, there are Google Maps. We've all used that one. But if you plugged the address of the business in on Google Maps, uh, or sorry, the business name in Google Maps to get all of the addresses, and then plug all of those addresses back into Google. Because what's interesting is in multi-site locations, you can often find user groups that meet in a business. And if you find a user group, you can go in and you can see what the business is like before the interview. Lots of useful data that way. Um, there's Google Groups, uh, forums, Usenet postings. They leak a lot of data about the technology that's in use internally. Uh, blogs, if you can identify the people's names, the Google blog search can find those people. You can find the topics they're interested in, which give you those little interest hooks you plant in the conversation as you go. A Google patent, very useful if the company's filed any patents. And if you actually take the time to read the patent application, you're going to be more qualified for the position than anybody who already works there, because very few employees read their own company's patents. And then Google code searches and things like that will give you a sense of code style. But there's more. There's Bing. Everybody's used Bing, right? It's great. Anybody use the Bing events subsearch? OK. This allows you to search within events. So you search for a type of event, and then you subfilter. It's a second layer of search that Bing offers that nobody else does. And that way, you can really cut out 
a lot of the direct that you don't need. Um, there's a tool called Yippy, which is a metadata remixer. It allows you to do deeper searches through iteration, not simply do one search and be done. It's intended to iterate through the different searches you're doing. Ixquick and Dogpile we've all heard of, I hope. Uh, those are basic multi-engine searches. Um, there's Yacy, which does a deeper search. It's a little harder to set up. And then there's Social, SO.CL, which is a Microsoft experiment. It's down about 80% of the time. When it's up, if there's data that's useful to you, it will give you everything. Absolutely everything about a person, all of their social media presences, what they're interested in, what their schedule is. It, when it hits, it hits big. It just doesn't hit very often. So as you go through this process, you're going to want to take notes. I like to use blank text files. Um, normally, when I give this talk to college kids, I have to explain what a text file is because they're used to Word. Um, I imagine you all know this. You want to gather timeline data, current data, and email formatting data, as well as whatever is interesting, because those particular pieces are going to be useful later. You can go through automated searching. Have everybody used Harvester? Come on. Download Harvester, play with Harvester. Uh, free Python script. It finds a lot of uh, email addresses, finds a lot of web hosts. Give it a company name, it just spews data at you. Um, you can also use Google search operators to basically get access to the paid LinkedIn features. Um, because using the, the site and the in URL modifiers, you can find all of the names of the people that work for a company, what their titles are, things like that. If you have the names from this and you have the email addresses from Harvester, it's just a quick Python or Perl script to create likely email addresses, which is very useful later in the process. Yeah. Um, Recon NG. Yeah, yeah. Recon NG is one I was going to skip over because I have limited time. Uh, Recon NG is an excellent tool. Uh, it's basically Recon within a Metasploit like interface. Um, there's a lot of paid features. Um, it, it searches APIs. So if there's a paid API, you can do deep searches in that. Um, you can also pay for access to Jigsaw, Salesforce, it's Salesforce's data.com or Hoover's or sometimes you can find credentials to get in. And uh, that gives you a lot of data uh, that salespeople use on companies, which can feed the process as well. Now there's deeper recon. Um, you've got the basic info, it's time to extrapolate. Because once you know who works there, what they do, what the products are, the question is what challenges, challenges do they face? Because you want to present yourself as being able to come in and solve their problems. You have to guess at them. You know, put yourself in the position of the person hiring you. you know, what, what is the firm doing? Look at press releases. Uh, Google can search press releases. There are also uh, Presswire is another site that does that. Uh, what's been tried in the past? What's the competition doing? Now, remember, no firm is perfect. Every firm thinks we need to do better at following best practices. So it's really easy to come in and make a case, oh, well, if you just do X, Y, and Z, listed under best practices, your problems will be solved. And they'll already be primed for responding to that message. Second, you want to find out who is likely to be interviewing you and kind of build a tree of, of this is what I think the organizational structure looks like. This is who will be interviewing me the first time. I need to elevate the conversation to this person because they're at the C level. They're more likely to be able to circumvent HR to give me the job. You also want to know about finances. A poor company is less likely to take a risk on you unless it's a company that's losing money that has backers that have money in other locations. Okay? This, uh, so public companies, you can search Google Finance, Yahoo Finance, go through the SEC filings. Actually reading some of the SEC paperwork gives you a treasure trove of data that can be used later. You can do a Google News search for the word loan in conjunction with a company to see if they're expanding or if they brought in a loan to uh, recover from a problem they had. Um, private firms, a little bit trickier, uh, but LinkedIn helps you identify ex-employees very easily, and ex-employees will just give you all sorts of data if you take them out to lunch. And just say, hey, I'm considering applying. Can I buy you lunch so you can tell me what it's like to work there? Uh, if they like to go out for drinks, Yay, even more data. 
<laughs> so um, yeah, just keep, keep passing them drinks. Works great. Um, don't be direct when talking about finances. You know, ask about stability. Ask if there are any projects that were started and stopped. You know, kind of faint around the issue because you don't want the target to know the, exactly what you're going for because that could cause them to close up. You want to make them open up, which means expressing interest in what they're interested in and asking leading questions. The goal of this entire process is to identify the reason for hire. Companies hire to support existing growth, to accelerate existing growth, to help the company become more profitable, to grow into new markets, and to recover from massive failure. And each one of those requires a slightly different spin in the process as you go through. You then want to, want to identify the present state of the company. Uh, Multigo is a great tool to do this. It can just uncover a lot of data. There's a free version and a paid version. The biggest difference is the paid version is faster. Um, doesn't cost that much. I have my own licensed copy. Uh, but the free version, you know, if you're looking for a job and you don't have a job, free version will basically do what you need. It'll just take a little longer to run. There's a site called Rapleaf and other sites like this which is a marketing site. You give it a list of email addresses and it returns demographic information. Why is that interesting? Well, demographic information includes political affiliation and average salary data. So if you can take this list of email addresses, which by the way, you've just created from the email format and the LinkedIn list, then it will tell you, you know, this is the percentage of people that are conservative versus liberal. This is the average salary range. This is the average age range all of which is useful when you're planning the salary negotiation process. You can also craft outreach emails. You can identify the people you want to target and their likely email addresses and their interests from some of these other sites. You can send them a, 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 basically a cold email saying, hey, I'm interested in this blog post you wrote a year ago. Can you answer question A, B, and C? And go through that kind of process. Um, you know, it, it works uh, pretty well. Okay, now you want to project in time. You need to be aware of the issues that have occurred in the organization's past that have led up to the current time. This avoids wasting time uh, in interviews and makes sure that the ideas you have are new to them. So you do this by mapping out their internet presence. Fierce is a tool that will give a lot of DNS data um, and you know, uh, ReconNG will do the same. You want to use this to identify web hosts. You want web hosts so you can feed into archive.org so you can figure out what their internet presence looked like last year, the year before, the year before that, and really build that timeline. And you want to identify the direction they're going so you can take a guess at their current goals. You want to determine their focus. Are they focused on retaining existing customers, getting new customers, or targeting investors? All of that tells you what the business is, in, is interested in so you can help them move forward in the direction they're going. If they're public, how's their stock doing? Not how is their stock doing compared to their stock in the past. How is their stock doing compared to their competitors? Because that's how C-level people measure themselves. They don't care if their stock went down two points, I mean, they care a little bit, if their competitor's stock all dropped by 10. That's a win for them. Similarly, if their stock goes up by 10 points and their competitors goes up by 50, they're losing the game even though they're becoming more profitable. And understanding that mindset is critical in determining the types of stories you want to tell in the process. So then you want to analyze the people you're talking to. By this point, you should have a feel for who you're going to interview with, who their boss is, who their boss's boss is, all the way up the tree. And uh, you can feed this, you can feed it into Multego, uh, the mapping tool I mentioned earlier, you know, searching on different people. Uh, you can also use a name check and side to identify likely uh, social media presences. And then if you can find those types of user IDs, you can do straight Google searches on it. That's where you might get into trouble and find data on fetish sites that you don't really want to know about. Um, voice of experience. Um, Look at Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, Flickr, we all know those. Also remember the old sites. People abandon old accounts. They don't shut them down. So there's data out there on MySpace, LiveJournal, and uh, Friendster still that can be quite useful. You want to identify their personality. 
Now, I would normally have a conversation about metaphor mapping here. Anybody who saw me this morning has already seen it. If you haven't, check out the video later. Um, these two books are excellent. Metaphors We Live By, if you have a deep academic background, is great. Everybody should read Images of Organization. It will change the way you communicate. So now it's time to reposition who you are. Okay? What's on the internet is there forever. Now, you can always go into your different sites, and I assume everybody's using KeyPass or LastPass or something, so you have a list of all of the sites on which you have accounts, right? We're all doing that, right? Okay. Visit each one and make sure the privacy settings are locked down. If there's one you don't want, shut the, sh close it out. You know, get rid of it completely, because you want to make sure that you show up the way you want to be seen. Google and Bing are not search engines. They're lenses that the rest of the world uses to bring things into focus. So what they're going to do is they're going to identify the pieces of you that you want others to know about in the top two pages. And almost nobody hits the third page of Google results or deeper. So that's really what you're looking for, is to, to control that level of things. Social media sites are, li are votes. Uh, each link is a vote in the Google world and in most of the other search engines. So the more cross-linking you get going on, the more you can, can own the search on your name. And then it comes time to do a cover letter. Um, you know, cover letters are, or an introductory letter is kind of what you would use if you want to do this sort of warm introduction to somebody. If you decide to go the traditional route, three paragraphs. Paragraph number one, Introduce yourself, your skills, and why you're awesome. Hopefully without coming across as an asshole. Two, why you think they're awesome. This is what most people forget. More people are willing to read a letter if it includes something about them. And then three, state your intent to call them. Give them three times that you will be giving them a call and follow through. Okay? You don't want to send out a letter that says, call me if you're interested. You want to maintain as much control over the process as you can so that when, when you say, I'm going to call, you call. That shows you have follow through, which most people don't have. And that's going to impress them enough in a lot of cases to invite you in for an interview. Now, when you do this, odds are each time you call, they're not going to answer. They're busy. You're going to need to leave a voicemail. So you want to write a voicemail script ahead of time so it sounds straight to the point, powerful, and intentional instead of having a lot of ums and uhs and, you know, I really expect you to talk to somebody. Write the script, practice it before you call, so when it go, you call, it goes through regularly. Now, if all this works, um, you may have to go through a couple of people to get it to work, but it normally works. You'll have a phone interview. Oh, that's the cover letter example. Okay. So, phone meetings. What's likely to happen is they're going to call you and say, okay, are you ready for an interview? And the answer is always no. The answer is always, I'm sorry, I'm heading out the door, I've got to catch a meeting, can we schedule something for a couple of days from now? Now why would you do that? Because you want to maintain control. You want to pick a time that works, you want to get your interviewer's name, you want to get their phone number, so it's like, okay, if, if they don't get a hold of me, what's their name, what's their number, so I can get a hold of them, you have the information, why do you do that? Because you've got their name. Now you can make sure you can go through, do all of the searches you want, do a deep dive on the person you're going to be talking to. You've got two days to do all of the reconnaissance you need and get prepped for the discussion. And then when you're there, when you're ready, you want to make sure that you have the environment set up properly. You need to be in the right location. You need internet access so you have quick lookups. Uh, you want it to be quiet so you can focus. You want to have access to these reference sheets you know, whether they're text files or something on a tablet, whatever you're doing. Um, you want to be able to stand up when you talk because people who stand up sound better. And you want to be able to have a, a mirror so you can look at yourself, so you can smile, because when people are smiling, they sound friendlier. Now, that puts most people in the bathroom. And you might not want to do that. Um, so get a mirror, hang it on the kitchen counter door, and stand there so you can have this discussion. Um, your two goals in this process is get a real interview and get the information you need to win at the real interview. Avoid all of the distractions. You're not there to chat. It's all business. Okay? 
then during that time you have between the phone interview and the regular interview, hopefully it's gonna be about a week, is when you put together your portfolio. So if you've got the in-person interview, you need to be able to take control of that. And people like things. So you need to have something to leave behind. And this is the approach I use that works. Uh, this is a standard two-pocket folder that is structured so one side has the cover letter in front with the resume in back and behind that examples of previous work. This is the portfolio stuff you've built, you've put online, you're just printing out on a nice paper so you can leave it behind. The other pocket has custom materials. This is materials created from the reconnaissance work you've done. This is going to be where you have market research, where you've identified gaps in the markets, you know, disruptive forces coming they might not have thought of yet, competitors, how the competitors rank against one another, not how the competitors rank against the company you're interviewing, because they're the expert in their company. They're not the expert in the other company because they spend all their time making sure their stuff's working. So by comparing all of the competitors to one another, you can then create a gap. It's like, hey, nobody's doing this. You make one of those little uh, spot charts you know, with X's and zeros or whatever you want. And it's like, hey, nobody's doing this. Here is the area you want to focus. Um, you want to create flow documents. Anybody actually done a PCI data flow? Any PCI consultants here? Okay. The same concept behind a PCI data flow, which is how data moves through an environment, applies to other business processes. It applies to sales processes, it applies to internal operational processes. Whatever you're doing, those sorts of flow diagrams visually depict things in ways most people aren't used to seeing. And when they see it, it's like, oh, it all makes sense now. And they're really easy to make. Um, you can look at products and service bundling, you know, finding other ways to, sh to, to basically pivot their products so it looks new to them. You know, the sky's the limit here. You want to make sure that uh, what you do looks professional with one exception. One document needs to have a typo. Why do you want a typo? Because when you're sitting in front of them and you pull out the folder to give them their copy, you go, oh, I didn't notice that typo, and you circle it, and you say, I'll send you another copy soon. At the end of the interview, you now have an excuse to send them an email. And you give them the corrected document that shows you remembered, you have follow through, and you have fast turnaround, which is exactly what companies want to see. Visual design matters. Um, this seems overwhelming and expensive, particularly if you're not a naturally visual person. But all of this can be done with Inkscape, GIMP, and LibreOffice, completely free open source tools. I did this stuff on Linux in my evenings. And there are online tutorials for how to do all of this. However you learn best, whether it's how-tos, videos, whatever you want to do, tons of information on how to use these tools. What you do is you go to the website, fire up GIMP, take a screenshot, take up the eyedropper tool, find the hex codes of the branding colors, build a branding color palette, and that feeds the documents you're going to create in LibreOffice and Inkscape. And then all you do is you put together whatever flows you want, whatever diagrams you want, and keep it simple, and it works really well. And if you need uh, stencils or something to use, Google search on file type colon SVG gives you all sorts of stuff you can load in with ease make a couple of modifications, and nobody can tell it's, it's something different. Last thing you want to do before the interview is uh, figure out how much money you're likely to be talking about. And this is where total compensation calculations come in. Who knows about total comp? Okay. The older people know about total comp. Um, so total compensation is how much is the company investing in you today? Because the trap you fall into is company says, well, what are you making now? And you give them your salary, and they offer you five grand above that, and you go, okay. okay. That's not necessarily what you want to do. You want to factor in the salary you're making, any bonuses and commissions, any costs the company paid for classes, travel, food, lodging, um, insurance costs, money they've invested to maintain your certifications or licensure, any retirement contributions they've made, um, figure out how much vacation and sick days are worth, add that to the total, and add the cost of any tools that you have. You have a justifiable number 
this is what the company spent on me last year, and you can say, I want 10% more than that. And it, it makes it up for a much better, cleaner discussion than just talking about take home. Um, you can also take that number and adjust it. If you want more frequent trainings, you want more vacation time, you need to do a cost of living increase for moving to a different city. All of that kind of stuff is, is very powerful. So now you want to really prep for the interview process itself. If it's local, pre-drive to the location. You want to make sure, number one, you're not going to get lost on the way to the interview the next day. But more importantly, by going through the parking lot, you can look at bumper stickers. Bumper stickers display personality of the people that work there. Um, you, know, you can identify political affiliation. The average cost of the car will show you the average salaries that they tend to make there. If you don't live there, you can do something similar with Google Street View. Um, use geolocation searches. There used to be a tool called Pushpin. It's been merged into ReconNG. It does a geolocation lookup of images from Imgur and things like that uh, and Instagram. And you can often get pictures of what things are like in the office. Why does that matter? Because you want to take those pictures to the local um, uh, clothier, you know, men's warehouse or wherever women go, I don't know, and uh, bring the picture and say, I want to look a little bit better than this. And they will happily dress you. You don't need to know a damn thing about fashion. It's great. <laughs> you want to plan for the questions they're going to ask because you are going to be more prepared for this interview than they are. So they're going to fall back to the basic stupid questions. Where do you see yourself in five years? What's your greatest weakness? You need to have good answers for those, and you want to make sure each answer you give refers back to a story point on the resume. Because what you're looking for in the interview is an excuse to pull out the folder, open it in front of them, pull out the resume, and point, and say, this is what I did, because you want to get them off of the script as soon as possible. Now, a good way to get these lists of questions is to get an interview book, any one of them, in audio format. So you listen to it in the car, you practice giving the answers back, because you want it to be easy and conversational. You don't want it to be rehearsed necessarily, but you want to get the ums and the uhs and the trying to remember which part of the resume you're talking about in there. Okay, and then once you have that, based on the recon you've done, you want to plant the conversation hooks. So you can drop them in the conversation as you go to make sure the, the interest level is at maximum when it's time to leave. So when you go in for the interview, you've got the portfolio, you've got everything else, and you want to answer five questions. Do I want to do the work? Will I fit into the culture here? Are they willing to pay me enough to compensate for any negatives of working here? Will they pay me enough for me to achieve my financial goals? And if all of those are yes, how do I advance the process? Because in almost every, every case, you're going to walk in, you're going to blow the socks off of them, they're not going to know what to do with you, and they're going to set up another meeting with you and their boss. So you want to make sure you get that advance to talk to their boss. Um, okay, you want to refer to those additional documents as often as possible. You know, you want to make sure that as early in the process as you can, with them appearing to trigger it, you want to be able to open up the portfolio so they look at it, because as soon as they see that, they're going to be blown off their script, they're going to start digging through some of the documents you gave them and asking you questions about that. As the conversation evolves, you want to visually describe things. You, know, you want to be able to flip over one of those documents and sketch on the back, or correct it live, and then give you another excuse to send them a PDF of the corrected copy. You also want to use whiteboards. Why do you sketch on the whiteboard? Because whiteboards are never erased. And you will be a constant reminder in their office of anybody they interview after you that you're there. Anything on red is going to stand out, and your name is going to be sitting in front of them for the next several weeks until they make a decision to hire you. So, supposing that interview process goes well, you know, the end of the interview is not really the end. You need to send thank you emails. You know, we all know this. Um, you want to include any corrections to the documents you've made, any elaborations you've made based on what you've learned. Um, you know, get them that electric copy, get them that email. You also want to write out thank you notes by hand. People still like that. Um, but if you're like me and your handwriting is terrible and your spelling is terrible, write it on a computer first 
make sure that all spelling is corrected, all grammar looks good, then handwrite it carefully and send those out the next day because what will happen is you'll have the interview, then that night they're going to, uh, if they're checking their email, they're going to get the thank you email or they'll see it in the morning. A couple of days after that, they're going to get the thank you note, which takes you that one step further than most people go, keeping you in their mind. Um, then you will have ended the interview by saying, okay, when will I expect to hear? And they'll give you a certain time, and it's never going to be that time because, in part, they're slow, they're busy, but also you've completely set them off their game. They're going to need some time to collect. So a day after they say they'll call you, you call them. You, know, you make sure that uh, you, know, you, you have your script, just like you did with the voicemail, and you just kind of reach out to each of the person that interviewed you and make, find out where you are in the process. Eventually, they will either bring you back for another interview, offer you a job, or say, I'm sorry, we can't afford you, or you're not what we're looking for. In most cases, it's we can't afford you, because taking this level of effort to get a job uh, will often set you at a higher salary level. And uh, usually, they will find the money. Sometimes they can't, and you, know, you get to negotiate for that, but you know, sometimes you have to move on. This is in salary negotiation. This is back to that total comp idea. Um, companies in negotiation are either going to be open to hearing your ideas or putting you in a take it or leave it position. If it's in the latter, you pretty much have to take it or leave it. There's not a lot of option there. If it's the former, consider the financial and non-financial benefits. You know, you've, salary is probably going to be fixed, but companies will gladly negotiate around hiring bonuses, stock, performance pay, uh, things like that. Um, they will like companies that take the risk with them. And in general, generally speaking, most companies will, offer, will give you a good deal, except when it comes to performance pay. Because companies, when they offer performance pay, very seldom follow through. Systems are constructed, so performance is based on the, how the way the team works, how well the team does. So you're in a situation where you are not getting paid for your performance, you're getting paid for your team's performance, and anybody who's done group projects in school knows that doesn't work. So take any other offer. Um, think about non-financial stuff, training, education, uh, paid time off, advancements in seniority. A lot of companies will bring you in as if you're a five-year employee, if that's necessary to get things to work within the business. Um, and as with all negotiation, your basics are be fair, know when to stop, and remember the organization's needs. The goal is to find the solution which maximizes benefit for both parties. Which comes to giving notice, you have to prepare for the worst. Um, in a lot of cases, you'll just be shown the door when you give notice at your current company, which means a week or so beforehand, you need to clean your desk and take home everything that matters to you. So if that happens, you can just walk out without a care. And instead of being a stressful time, it's, hey, I just got two weeks of paid vacation. Right? Um, consider benefits. It used to be there was a big health care gap problem where you, know, you would have to wait several months before the health care kicked in at the new business. That's really going away with COBRA, with uh, Affordable Care Act, things like that. But if that's a concern, think about how it ends. Uh, one thing you can do is take a vacation day at the end of the month with your current job and start the new job on that day and then end your current job the, the, you know, after. So you basically have overlapped by one day and the month to month gap is no longer there. Um, think about uh, retirement. You, know, you can roll your money into something you control instead of into your own employer and you know, start the new 401k with them but keep control of your own at this point. It's a powerful thing later in life. Um, think about non-compete agreements. You know, if you have had to sign one, and in Iowa, the controls aren't nearly as good as in other companies. In Iowa, a company can hire you and then retroactively make you sign an employment agreement. So if that's likely to bite you, get an employment lawyer on the phone ahead of time. Um, you can usually negotiate non-competes down in terms of scope. A lot of times you can negotiate like a nationwide, you will not do security work in the US for one year down to something like, I won't solicit existing customers for one year. You know, they're, they're really willing to negotiate if that comes up. Um, think about intellectual property. Things you've created on the job may not be yours, depending on how the job's created. 
So your options are, you know, leave it behind, try to buy it from the company, don't necessarily recommend stealing it, um, or recreate it as an open source project if it's something you really think is, is useful. You know, you have those options in front of you. And once all of that's done, give notice in writing. There are good ways and bad ways to do that. Um, think about negotiation rates for work you do after you leave. If they view you as, as indispensable, uh, one thing you can do is say, hey, if you need me, my negotiation rate or my after work rate is $250 an hour. And if they say, wow, that's high, you can say, well, it'd be lower if you knock this non-compete out of the way. You know, negotiating on things like that is pretty easy to do, and very few people think of doing it. Now, you may be given a counteroffer. Counteroffers are games you only play once. It burns your current employer and your prospective employer. And uh, you will really probably never get a raise there again if you ever take a counteroffer. So it's almost never worth playing. Which gets us to the exit interview. When you're leaving, HR is going to sit you down and they're going to say, well, we'd really like you to tell us what we could have done better. They don't want to know. If they wanted to know, they would have fixed it before you left. So the answer is always, it was time for a change. And just let it go and walk out the door into your new job. So this information came from these resources and these ones. And those. And those. And I put it all in a book. So if you want the book, feel free to buy the book. Uh, it's available anywhere online books are sold or pirated. So enjoy. <laughs> and I'll leave that up for a little while. Any questions at this point? Um, so that's true. I mean, you, you sh there's a psychological concept of pinning, and if you name your number first, then their offer is going to come closer to your number than whatever number they had in their head. People talk about doing ranges, things like that. The idea behind total compensation is to figure out what you will accept, what your range is. So you know you can get your total comp, and if you just want to move for something that's interesting, not necessarily more money, you can do plus or minus 10% on that, and that's your asking range. Um, in general, the idea of them t saying the price first is great. What it's turned into today is uh, it, it's like a junior high dance. Everybody's standing on the sides, nobody actually wanting to dance. Nobody wants to name a number first. So put that aside. If you know what you want, just say the damn number and move on with stuff that actually matters. Um, I believe he was next. Um, what about the, you know, tailoring the, the resume for a job? The reason I ask is because before I worked, my boss called me and said, hey, look at this guy's resume. Mm -hmm. And then, so he looked at his resume, and then he Googled the guy, found his resume online, and it didn't, he, he basically, you know, put certain things in the resume Yep. That he didn't have before, so it's like, does he actually have that experience? Because he's putting on the resume here, but the one he had out online, he didn't have that. So which okay. one do you use? Well, so if you have control over your presence, the resumes will match. Because you're going to be targeting one company at a time. You know which resume you sent out. You update the online one to match mm -hmm. what you want. The problem is uh, companies like Dyson Monster. I mean, I'm getting calls today for a Monster resume I put up 10 years ago. And they're saying, hey, we need a help desk technician. It's like, I don't do that work anymore. <laughs> um, so you, know, you need to have control to a certain point. But you know, some mistakes you made in your youth, they're just there. There's nothing more you can do about it. So. Yes, Dan. What kind of feedback have you had from your books when people have looked at it? The piraters love it. <laughs> um, it's, I'm not kidding when I say it's on every piracy site. Um, it's been, p people like it. Uh, a lot of people say it's overly technical. A lot of technical people say it's not technical enough, which means I hit that mark just right. Um, it works. And what, what it, it does is a lot of the people that have read it have emailed me and said, thank you for getting me the job I've always wanted. Um, other people that have not used the book 
have stopped complaining to me about not getting a job. So win-win, right? Uh, if it's one, um, not that much of a concern because everybody's made a typo. And the fact that you follow up and correct it gives you a chance to look more professional than anybody else. So, yep. Yes? I, I can't hear you. Speak up. Right. How often they check their phone. Um, I mean, th there are other ways, but you can kind of tell when somebody's paying attention or dozing off or distracted. So, yeah. Anything else? All right. There's my contact info. I'll leave it up for a few minutes before I clear out for the next uh, next person. So, thank you.